The non-aggression principle is paramount to all anarcho-capitalists, whether the natural right ones or the consequential ones. I don't know. I think almost any really clearly stated strong principle is hard to defend. And that it's not clear how you defend aggression. That after all, if I trespass on your property with a gigawatt laser beam, I'm clearly violent, clearly aggressing against you, maybe burning you up. But what if I do it by turning on a flashlight? That how in principle do we draw a line between levels of interference with you or your property that count as aggression and ones that don't, given that it's really a continuous range? That you could say that if I can see the light in your house from my window, that proves that photons that you created have trespassed on my property, so you're an aggressor. And nobody does do it that way. But that suggests, I think, why the non-aggression principle sounds better as rhetoric mm -hmm. than as, as serious philosophy. Well, I was going to add on to this that uh, it does not hold water in every situation, such as uh, life and death situation. Do you see this as a perhaps significant problem to the anarcho-capitalist political theory? Well, but since that's not my, my political theory doesn't hold that you, that it's central. But I would have said that it isn't really life and death that's the issue, I don't think, at least to me. Suppose you say, what if I can save my life by killing three other people? Suppose I need organ transplants, say. Many people would, I think, reasonably say I would probably do it, but I would be wrong to do it. But isn't that a life and death situation, sort of, I mean, in a way? <laughs> it is a life, but my, my point, the point is that the life and death situation is one where the stakes are so high that you will do something you think is wrong. But I think the harder problem is the case where you would do something that violated rights and not think it was wrong. And that's the, the example I think that I gave in, in my book is, imagine that an asteroid is going to hit the Earth. And by some bizarre set of circumstances, you can stop it, but only by stealing a nickel from somebody who is the rightful <laughs> owner of the nickel, uh, or a, a device that will somehow stop the asteroid. That's an extreme case. But, you, but imagine, I have other examples, but imagine a situation where a very small violation of rights will prevent a very large cost in human welfare. Uh, another example I use is imagine that there's a madman who's got a gun and is shooting a crowd. And the only way of stopping him is to grab a gun that belongs to somebody else and shoot him. And you happen to know that the person who the gun belongs to would not give you permission. So you're violating his rights by taking his gun. But if you don't do that, the madman will kill a bunch of people. Most of us would take the gun. So I think that those are the, that the hard cases for the non-aggression principle are the ones where you have a trade-off between a very small violation of rights and a very large gain in other things that human care, humans care about, such as saving human life. And that's one of the reasons why I don't try to base my arguments on the non-aggression principle. That I would say, in terms of my morality, that violating rights is bad, but it's not the only bad thing, that I'm not willing to violate your rights in order to get a moderate benefit for other people, but if a small violation of your rights gives a very large benefit in other terms, I'd probably be willing, be willing to do it. Uh, moving on to a small uh, problem with anarchy uh, for, for, for myself. Uh, I want to see whether you can maybe persuade me to move uh, to your side all the way. Uh, um, how will anarcho-capital society protect life, liberty, and property of those who are unable or are simply freeloading, refusing to pay for protection yeah. in a free market. But I would have said that people who are simply refusing to pay uh, will not get very well protected, just as people who refuse to pay for food don't eat. Uh, I think that in a reasonably attractive society, people who aren't paying because they have no money at all, if you imagine somebody who has you know, some very serious physical handicap so he can't earn anything, are likely to receive charity from people who, who want to help them. But uh, I expect that if you do not hire a rights enforcement agency and you get into a court, into a dispute with somebody, his agency will probably try to offer you a court trial on the grounds that they want to maintain their reputation of being sort of respectable people who don't push other people around. But they don't have to, 
because you don't have any way of using force in your own defense. But that's a reason why sensible people will, in fact, buy protection just as sensible people buy food and buy, buy housing. And that after all, it's not as if the government gives you protection for free. That typically in the U.S., and I suspect many other places, many poor people live in the places where crime rates are high, in the places where the government does a poor job of protecting them. In addition to which, most people, even poor people in a government system, pay taxes. They may pay uh, sales taxes, they may or may not pay income taxes depending on their income, they may implicitly pay taxes in that some of the things they buy are more expensive because the sellers are being taxed on them and so forth. So, uh, I, if you look at the budgets of real existing governments, the amount spent on protecting rights is very small. Uh, now, I'm not including national defense. That's a different problem. If you think about preventing ordinary crime, that when I wrote Machinery of Freedom, I think I looked up the numbers for total expenditure on police and courts and prisons. And I think it was something like $100 per capita per year. I don't remember, but it was that kind of small number that most of what governments collect taxes for is, is other, other and more expensive things. So the almost everybody in an anarcho-capitalist society who merely paid for protection would be paying much less than he is now paying in taxes. Okay, but my question is really those few cases, and, and, I, and I agree that... Which case? The person who can't afford it or the person who chooses not to? Both of them, for whatever reason. But then I would say, the problem is, what does it mean to say that you have a right not to be murdered? And I think it could mean either of two different claims. One of them is to say, if anybody murders you, he's acting wrongly. The other is to say, if other people don't protect you from murder, they're acting wrongly. And I would say, I only believe in the first. That if somebody murders you, he is acting wrongly. It is appropriate for you or somebody else to shoot him to stop him from murdering you. But I don't think that if somebody doesn't offer to protect you from murder, that he's acting wrongly. I don't think you have the right to go to somebody and say, unless you guard me, I'll kill you. Which is, in a sense, the logic of saying you have a right not to be murdered in the, in the second sense. So I would have said that in an anarcho-capitalist society, if you choose not to pay for food, you might starve to death. And if you choose not to pay for having your rights protected, you might not get your rights protected.